So I'm Mike McCulloch. I've got a, a BSc in physics uh, from York and a PhD in ocean physics, physical oceanography from Liverpool. Um, and then I worked for a while at the, the Met Office for 10 years and now I'm a lecturer in geomatics at Plymouth University. Um, so I'm going to be talking about quantized inertia. Um, so uh, sort of plan of the talk, I'm going to uh, ask the question of what is inertia, introduce the theory of quantized inertia, talk about astronomical evidence for it, and uh, excuse me a minute, and then uh, describe some experimental tests that we've been doing and then some possible applications of the theory. Okay. Um, Okay, so the, the basic problem is that galaxies spin far faster than physics allows. So this is a galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, uh, spinning around. Um, and so the stars at the edge are spinning around like this. And if you consider a star right at the edge, you can look at the Doppler shift of the star. And if you look at how fast it's going, you can also count up the number of stars in the galaxy uh, based on the light you can see. And if you calculate the gravity, uh, gravitational force pulling it in, you'll find it's much less than the centrifugal force that should be pushing it out. So galaxies should explode, but they don't. Uh, so this was found by Fritz Vicky in 1933, uh, and then in more accuracy by, by Vera Rubin in 1980. Okay. Um, so the usual solution for this is to add dark matter to the galaxy, so they add invisible matter to it to increase the gravitational attraction and balance the centrifugal force. Um, but I don't like this solution because it's arbitrary. We have to add a different amount of dark matter to each galaxy, and I, I don't think it's very scientific. So I've been looking at alternative uh, ways to fix the problem. Okay, so there's the old mystery of inertial mass. Uh, things tend to keep going in straight lines until we stop them. And that's never really been understood, uh, just assumed uh, that things keep going. Uh, inertial mass is not due to the Higgs field, which only explains a very small proportion of the, the inertial mass, about 0.1%, um, only explains the mass of the quarks. So I proposed a new model of inertia that combines relativity and quantum mechanics in a in a new kind of way. Um, okay, so just to give you a bit of background, if you have an object just uh, standing still or moving in, at a constant speed, then it will see a quantum background that's extremely weak. So I've shown it with a sort of pink background here. Um, and this is composed of virtual particles which pop out of nowhere in pairs and then recombine a few nanoseconds later. Um, and these particles are also associated with, with waves, just as everything is in, in quantum mechanics, quantum waves. Um, the quantum background, background is extremely weak, and also it's uniform in space, or assumed to be, so there is no force. But the first, uh, the first anomaly uh, for this was, was noticed by, by Casimir, or predicted by Casimir. He said that if you put two parallel plates in this field, then certain of these quantum waves would be un disallowed between the plates because they wouldn't fit, whereas outside them, any old wave will be allowed. So you tend to get a weakened quantum vacuum between the plates, and therefore you should get a force pushing them together. And this is called the Casimir effect, and it has been confirmed that this is actually what happens. So this quantum vacuum is, is indeed there. Okay, so the way I'm gonna get inertia from it is as follows. So imagine you have an object here, the black black circle here, and it's accelerating to the right. Now, according to relativity, information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So this means that from the part of the universe to the left of the object, um, no information can be gathered at the object itself. And so there's a a blind zone, if you like, or a, a horizon in that direction. 
So this has two effects. The first effect is that these virtual particles that you, they were being emitted all the time and recombining, if a pair is emitted right on the horizon, uh, the one that goes behind the horizon would be lost from the point of view of the spaceship forever. So it will no longer be able to recombine with its twin, which will become then real and will be emitted as what's now called Onru radiation. So I've shown this here. So this particle will be surrounded by a bath of warm thermal radiation because of its acceleration and because this horizon is splitting the quantum vacuum and making it real. The second effect, so that's the first effect, the kind of enhancement of the vacuum. The, the second effect uh, is that the horizon itself, and this is my assumption, but I'll, I'll show there's lots of evidence for it. The horizon itself will damp the, uh, the unmoved field or the enhanced quantum vacuum uh, close to it. So I've shown that with a sort of blue area here close to the, uh, the horizon. Whereas on the other side of the particle is red. So that means the uh, enhanced quantum vacuum is more intensely. Um, this means there will be a push, a radiated push on the particle backwards against its acceleration. And that's shown by this, this white arrow here. Okay, so this seems to qualitatively explain um, the phenomenon of inertia. It pushes objects back against whatever acceleration they might have. So I'm using Unruh radiation. So how solid is this? Have we uh, seen it? So the answer to that is uh, possibly. Um, it's moving towards probably now. Uh, this, there are two pieces of evidence for it. The difficulty with seeing it is that the wavelength of Unruh radiation, this lambda here, is given by eight times the speed of light squared, the acceleration of the object that's uh, doing the looking. So for terrestrial accelerations, this um, so accelerations of about 10 meters per second per second, uh, the wavelength is seven light years, which is not seeable. But if the acceleration is extremely high, so this acceleration is a big number, then uh, we might be able to see the radiation. Uh, one way to get high accelerations is to shine a laser onto a gold nanotip, as was done in an experiment by Bevers Lewis back in 1994. They shone a laser on a nanotip and they saw plasmons going around the bend of the, the nanotip, the, the tip of it, which, was, which involved a very high acceleration. And they saw a peculiar uh, form of light coming off. And Smolyaninov in 2005, he showed that this was consistent with Anu radiation. Also, more recently, there's a paper just about to be published. It's going through uh, review of hell at the moment uh, by Lin Shitao, 2021, titled Experimental Evidence for the Onu Effect. And that's on the archive. And they show that Onu radiation has probably been seen in highly decelerated electrons in particle accelerators. So that's, that's worth a look. So there is some evidence that Onu radiation does exist. Okay, so the, the model with a bit more detail is as follows. So you have an object uh, moving to the right, accelerating to the right. It sees a horizon to the left, it comes from relativity. It sees only waves all around it, it comes from quantum mechanics. And these waves are not canceled on the right-hand side of the object, but they are canceled on the left-hand side by a sort of Casimir effect. Only wavelengths that uh, can fit between the object and the horizon can exist. So you get a pushback on the object. Okay, so I published this part of the theory in a paper in 2003, this one, in the top right. Okay. Um, but this is not the entire story because what happens if you have um, an object which has an extremely low acceleration? So if A here is extremely uh, low, then the wavelength of the under waves will be extremely long or the horizon will move back a very long way. And if it moves back far enough, then it'll be the same distance as a cosmic horizon. So now the, these on the waves are being damped equally on both sides of the object. So this mechanism for inertial mass will collapse uh, for very low accelerations. And that's indeed just what we need for, for galaxies. Um, let me just show you the, um, uh, the galaxy here. So, Galaxies behave perfectly well in the center where the accelerations are high, 
but they only start to misbehave right at the edge where accelerations are very low. Okay, so I'll try and get a bit more quantitative here. So this is a, a new derivation for quantized inertia. I've uh, produced a few in various different ways. This is a brand new one, so I thought you'd be interested to see this. Um, so if you start by considering one Planck mass accelerating to the right, so I've shown that in the schematic here, and the crucial point is that you have a Ringler horizon on this side of it, so you can say that its uncertainty in position is small on this side of it, and it sees the cosmic horizon on the other side, so you could see that its uncertainty in position is large on this side, so dx is uh, the Hubble distance over 2, for example, and on this side it's a much lesser lesser value. Um, so this being the case, and having Heisenberg's uncertainty principle here, so we've got the uncertainty in momentum and the uncertainty in position has to be greater than h bar over 2. If dx is small, then delta p must be uh, large. So on this side of the Planck mass, we need a, a large uncertainty momentum, and on this side, we need a, a small one. And this means that the, the object is more likely to move to the left. Um, okay, so, so if you uh, say that the force is a derivative of the momentum like this, and you can say it's the speed of light times dp by dx, and if you assume that dx comes from the distance to the horizons, which is um, the basis of quantized inertia, then you can say that the force is equal to c times the difference. So this is dp, the difference in momentum on both sides. So on the right hand side, it's uh, 2 h bar over the theta over 2, which is that distance. And on the left hand side, it's h bar over c squared over a, which is this distance to the horizon here. And if you work all this out, you get this formula here. First thing is that uh, this uh, is a Planck mass, which is encouraging. That's the value of the Planck mass. This is the um, uh, the formula for quantized inertia. It's, it's how inertial mass varies in quantized inertia from what we normally expect. And this, of course, is, is A. So this is um, uh, the modified form of F equals MA. Newton's second law. So that's one way to derive it, and I published other ways previously, but this is brand new and I haven't published it yet. Um, you can also do similar things with, with gravity, and this is just really an aside, but if you do the same thing, uh, considering, say, the Earth orbiting around the Sun, you find that its uh, uncertainty in position towards the Sun is less and it's uncertainty in position away. And so it's uh, the delta p, it's uncertainty momentum must be greater towards the sun. And if you assume this, you, you can derive Newton's gravity law in just the same way. And I published this in 2014. So that's quite neat. Um, so you can get both gravity and inertial mass from this, uh, from this method. You can also get it from information. So this is just a quick derivation that I published last year. Um, if you imagine that this line here is an object accelerating to the left, then initially we can see all the way to the cosmic horizon. And if you assume that each Planck length is one bit, because that's the smallest region of space you can store information in, um, then it had a lot of energy stored in space. If it accelerates to the left, then it now sees a closer, much closer Rindler horizon, which is shown by this middle line here. Um, so it has fewer bits of space, and it's lost quite a few bits here. Uh, so if you use Landauer's principle, and you work out the energy uh, that it's gained from losing all these bits of space that it used to be able to see but now can't, then you get the energy required for inertial mass, and specifically the quantized inertia version of inertial mass. So this is uh, a derivation from information theory. Okay, um, so the formula, the formula I get is this. So this is the modified inertial mass. This is the original one, the one that we've always uh, known about. And this is this, uh, this new factor, one minus two times the speed of light squared over the acceleration of the object times the cosmic diameter. So you can see that 
uh, if the acceleration is very large, then this term is extremely small. Um, it's about uh, 2c squared over theta. Theta is about 10 to the 26, so this is about 10 to the minus 10. So it makes no difference at all. But only if acceleration becomes really small does this term become boosted enough to affect the inertial mass. And it turns out if you plot the acceleration along the x-axis and the ratio between the inertial mass and the gravitational mass on the y-axis, then what you would expect is the equivalence principle, of course, which is the green, the green line, but it predicts a drop-off of the inertial mass for very low accelerations. Um, now, this is very similar to, to MOND, um, uh, modified Newtonian dynamics, which is an empirical hypothesis. Um, and I'll come to that in a bit. Um, but the first thing you can do with this is to put it straight into Newton's second law and gravity law, replace the inertial mass with, with this term. And you get this. Uh, so the acceleration is equal to the gravitational acceleration plus a constant uh, term, which is independent of mass. The great thing about it being independent of mass is that it leaves the equivalence principle intact. So if Galileo got balls of two different sizes off the Tower of Pisa, they would still land uh, together. Um, the other thing is that the value of this new term is equal to the cosmic acceleration um, that, that has recently been seen. So that's, that's good. And of course, it also uh, fixes the galaxy rotation problem because it reduces the inertial mass of the edge of galaxies by just the right amount to reduce the centrifugal force. So it's balanced by, by gravity. Um, and I published a paper on that in 2012. And then a later one in 2017, uh, which is shown here. Um, so the, the formula, uh, the predicted velocity of the edge of galaxies is given by this formula, b to the power 4, which is 2g mc squared over, over theta. Um, and the useful thing is there are no adjustable parameters in here. So all these values are known. Gravitational constant, m is the visible mass of the galaxy, that's the speed of light, and the Hubble diameter is known fairly well. And it agrees with the data. So the plot shows the expected acceleration of different galaxies, um, and the observed acceleration is shown up the y axis. And if Newton was exactly right, then we would have all the data, which is shown by the squares, would lie along the diagonal. If they don't, they're shifted upwards, which means that for low accelerations, the speed is greater than we, we expected. And quantized inertia predicts this, and it's shown by the, the dashed line. The, this other theory called MOND also predicts it, it's shown by the solid line. But the thing about MOND is you have to add a, a particular parameter uh, called A0, you have to put it in by hand. Whereas with quantized inertia, uh, you don't have to put anything in by hand, it all comes out of the uh, uh, of known parameters. Okay, so I published this paper in 2017. Um, th there is more direct evidence though. This is um, a nice way to look at it. This orange disk shows a galaxy. At the center of galaxies, the acceleration is quite large. So we have um, high accelerations and short under waves, which I've shown at the bottom with these red, red waves. As you go out to higher radii, the under waves lengthen, the accelerations go down. And at exactly the, uh, at the, radi at exactly the radius where the under wa waves are as large as the cosmic diameter, that's exactly the point where galaxies start to misbehave. And beyond that, they, they misbehave. So this is, a direct, this is direct evidence that it's quantized inertia and under waves, under radiation, that is the cause of this, um, uh, this problem. Okay, um, so more evidence, uh, very good evidence. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's uh, more evidence from wide, wide binaries. Uh, these are stars that are extremely far apart, more than 7,000 AU, but still mutually bound together. Um, so this, is, this shows some wide binaries. The great thing about why binaries is that you can't add dark matter to them to, um, to fix the problem. And they do behave very much like galaxies in that they uh, orbit far too fast. Uh, dark matter can't be added because it has to stay spread out on the scale of galaxies. And if you allow it to clump, 
then you can't then argue that it has to stay spread out at the galaxy's edge. So wide binaries are perfect tests for quantized inertia. Uh, so I got my postdoc, Dr. Jesus Lucio, to uh, simulate this, and he produced a model uh, modeling two wide binaries, which are shown by these red dots here, in uh, with both Newton, with Mond, with QI, and only QI keeps them bound. So you can see that only the red, the red orbit is bound. Uh, Mond and Newton allow them to separate. And of course, wide binaries are observed to be uh, bound. So, um, so we published this in 2019 in this paper. Here. Okay, I've also just submitted a paper to Astrophysics and Space Science showing that quantized inertia does do the job of general relativity. It does the same job as general relativity in predicting the bending of starlight by the sun. Um, so I'm sure you know that one of the four main tests of, of GR, general relativity, is that uh, it correctly predicts the bending of starlight close to the sun, um, and QI does as well. Um, so I'm currently trying to persuade reviewers of, of this, um, but the, the derivation is quite, quite simple actually. Um, so, uh, given all this, this evidence, um, this seems to show that we understand, we may have a new understanding of inertial mass. And if, if this is the case, can we, uh, can we utilize it? Can we use it? So one way we could do this is to have a highly accelerated core, uh, shown here by a spinning disk or something like that. This will see onward waves, shown by the red, red curves. Uh, which will hit it from all different directions. But what if we then put a damper, a uh, metal plate, in one direction to damp, uh, in some sense, these under waves? Although we don't really understand the physics of damping under waves, it's, it's likely that metal plates will have some effect. Uh, then there'll be no under radiation from above, sorry, uh, but there will be some from below, so this object will move upwards. It will, it will have uh, uh, propellantless propulsion. Uh, normally the way we get things to move upwards is to fire things out the bottom very fast. Uh, this will move things without doing that. Uh, so I've published a couple of papers opposing this sort of thing. Um, there are various ways you might try to do this and of course all the, a lot of these tests are extremely uh, controversial but they seem to point towards this sort of thing going on. Um, for example, Paul Kletnoff in 1994, he famously talked about an asymmetric disk, which he accelerated. The interesting thing about his superconducting disk is that the upper portion of it had a very small crystal structure, and the lower part of it had a very large uh, crystal structure. So looking at under radiation this way, um, it would be more damped on the upper surface and below, because these cavities, if you like, are smaller and finer than these ones. So you would get a kind of um, under spectrum looking like this. So more under waves below, fewer above, so you would get an upwards force. Uh, similarly, uh, Scheuer, Roger Scheuer's M drive, 2001, he found that uh, putting microwaves into a cone, an asymmetric cone, produced some kind of thrust, perhaps towards, towards the left, towards this narrow end. And this also fits with quantized inertia because at the wide end you could have more on waves allowed and at the narrow end you'd have fewer so you would see a gradient which would push it in to the left at its now narrow end. Uh, James Woodward in California in the 1990s he looked at asymmetric capacitors he vibrated them with uh, piezoelectrics here and he had one thick plate and one thin plate and he found a move towards the thick plate and this fits too because thick plates should damp under waves more than the thin plates, so you would get again kind of a spectrum like this. And there have also been studies by T.T. Uh, Brown in the 50s looking at capacitors, and NASA have all, all also looked at this, which produced thrust, and I'll get to that directly in a, in a moment. Um, uh, but at this point I was contacted by, by DARPA and I applied for funding, and I got $1.3 million dollars to try and uh, demonstrate this in the lab. 
so the um, so DARPA, uh, I'm sure you know about it, but it's a defense advanced research projects agency. So they were, had a hand in GPS, the ARPANET, the precursor to the internet and stealth technology, for example. So the project aims, my project aims to make quantized inertia more predictive. That's what I was asked to do. And then show whether or not it can indeed counter gravity or produce thrust or even launch. So, um, it's titled Propellantless Propulsion from Quantized Inertia, and I've got, I had, three teams. So the first team I set up was at Plymouth, uh, so obviously myself and my postdoc, um, Jesus Lucio, and I've got another postdoc coming in here next month. <clears throat> there was a lab in Dresden under Professor Martin Timer, and a lab in Madrid, Spain, under Professor Jose Luis Perez Diaz and his team. Um, so these two labs were supposed to do experiments, and Plymouth, we were, we were going to do the theory part of it. But since then, it's, it's kind of um, expanded quite, quite a lot. Um, so this is a list of the teams that are currently working, or some of them anyway. Um, some of them I can't, can't mention. So this is the Dresden team, the first one. Um, their experiment involved firing the laser into an asymmetric cavity, and they got a zero thrust. Um, unfortunately, but I think the experiment was flawed because they put their cavities that were supposed to be asymmetric in a, a metal, symmetric metal box. But um, th there's some argument about this. The second lab, uh, though, got a positive result. So the way they did it, I'll describe in more detail in a minute, but they fired a laser into a fiber optic loop um, and they got a thrust of 0 0.07 newtons per kilowatt, which is really good because it's better than ion drives um, that are used on satellites. And then, um, as I'll describe in a bit, there was a, a third team that got in touch with me, um, which had a, an even better result, 120 uh, newtons per kilowatt, a, a private lab in the US. And uh, since then, another team has come along to, to replicate their results and they have confirmed that, that result. Um, so I'll discuss this in more detail in a minute. There's also a team in California uh, with Professor Barnhart and Dr. Reed. Um, I should say this, this second capacitor, uh, the first capacitor team was Becker and Batts, and the, the second one was uh, Richard Mansell at Evo. Or Ivo. Um, the Californians are working, but they've been significantly delayed by, by COVID. Um, uh, and then I'm setting up a lab test at Plymouth itself now. Um, I've just recruited a very good um, scientist to help. So uh, we're, we're starting in September. Okay, so I'll just discuss the Madrid experiments in a bit more detail. So what they did was they had a, a laser firing at 0 0.129 watts and they fired it into a metal, uh, sorry, a fiber optic loop with 300 turns. Uh, the idea is that the photons will see only radiation. And then they put a metal plate underneath it. The idea there is that it will damp the UNRU waves close to the metal plate, and there'll be a gradient which will push the loop down, so it'll increase its mass. Um, as an extra test, they also tried putting a metal plate above the uh, laser loop to see if the effect would disappear, as it should. Um, because now you've got a symmetrical uh, field. Okay, and the results uh, were as follows. So um, the experiment is uh, shown in the first column, where the plates were shown in the second column, the power inputs, third column, the radius of the loop shown here, the prediction, this is column, and the observed um, thrust is shown in the final column. So the, uh, the first result, which is actually a combination of several results, but averaged together, um, showed a round loop with a power in of 0 0.06 watts and the predicted thrust was 2.7 micronewtons, the observed one was 3.9, but as you can see the error bar is rather large because the, the noise was, uh, was too large. Then they tried a test with uh, a greater power, 0 0.129 watts, and the predicted thrust was six, about 6 micronewtons the observed one was 10 plus or minus 6, which is significantly 
different from zero. So th this is a good sign. Um, and when they put the plates um, above and below, so it was symmetric, they, they saw no, no thrust. So for this result, the force to power ratio is 0 0.07 newtons per kilowatt. Um, so that's better than iron, the performance of iron drives without fuel. So we need to um, replicate this and try to um, unambiguously prove, prove it's going on. Um, now, then there's this other team. So this wasn't part of the plan, but an electrical engineer called Frank Becker contacted me in 2017 um, he'd read my papers on quantized inertia and um, remembered some experiments he did years ago um, trying to reproduce the T.T. Brown effect, uh, which was also quite, quite controversial, and thought that his test could be evidence for, for it. So I liaised with him on an experiment and he received funding and experimental help from Anka Bat, who is an actor but also an MSc in electrical engineering. And they published a paper on, on the archive about this. Um, so I should say that several groups since the 1930s have reported anomalous thrust from capacitors towards the anode, the positive terminal of the capacitor. For example, T.T. Brown <clears throat> in Paris, uh, called the Bielefeld Brown effect. Uh, Canning of NASA 2003, they sourced um, thrust in the vacuum uh, from capacitors discharging. And the Japanese um, chap called Musha in 2008, um, but that wasn't in the vacuum. So there's a good summary in this paper here. Becker and Bat's experiment looked like this. They had a power supply, 5,000 volts. They put it into the capacitor, which is here on a digital scale. And um, let's see. Now the current is about 10 microamps. And the data is shown here. So this is taken from their paper in 2018. So on the x-axis is the separation between the capacitor plates. Um, so we go from about one millimeter here down to about one micron here. Oops. And the results are shown by the red, the red dots. Uh, so this is the normalized force in newtons up here, up the y-axis. And the best result they got was for a very, um, so two plates that are very close together, uh, about 10, 10 micron, a bit more than 10 micron, maybe 60 micron, something like that. And it was about 100 newtons per kilowatt, which is huge. And if we can confirm it, it means we can actually launch things with this, this system. So, um, but we have to be very careful uh, because there are, there can be other effects that can cause this kind of thing. Um, a digital scale was used in this case, which um, some people have expressed concern about. Okay, so the, the reason I think this is happening is that normally you have an electron accelerated like this, so accelerated to the right, shown by the upper panel, and it sees fewer on the waves behind it because they're damped by the Rundle horizon more on the waves in front because they're not damped so it sees a force backwards and that's its inertial mass in the case of the capacitor plates they completely cancel out well more or less completely cancel out the quantum vacuum between them so now the situation is reversed we have some quantum vacuum behind the plates we have actually nothing here um, at all so the electrons are pushed further forward uh, so in a sense their inertial mass has been reversed by the capacitors. Okay, so the electrons get an extra kick, which they then pass on to the anode when they hit it. So you can actually predict this, and I've, I've just done this work and put it up on research gate, actually from the, the Casimir effect, which is essential really to um, quantize inertia. It's uh, quantize inertia predicts the Casimir effect as well. I think it's the same thing. Um, so you can, um, instead of direct, deriving this directly from quantized inertia, I tried to do it from the Casimir effect, which is a, a better known phenomenon, and which, which will show the, the agreement between the two. Um, so this is the Casimir force, proportional to the separation between the plates to the power four. So what I've done here is instead of having h-bar, which is the energy, uh, the dual seconds in the vacuum, 
with a normal vacuum. I've taken account of the, that the vacuum has been energized by the fact that the electrons have been accelerated. Uh, so we have an, an energy we put in times tau, which represents the time that it, this energy stays between the plates. Um, so if you go through this here, you can see that this um, equals the power you put in to the system. So the, the current times the voltage uh, times the separation between the plates squared divided by the velocity, the average velocity of the electrons between the plates. And you can work out this V as well and substitute that in. It depends on the charge in the electron, the mass of the electron and the voltage, for example. And you get a force equation that looks like this. So I've here I've simply um, put in the values for the charge in the electron and the mass of the electron, etc. Um, so you get a constant in front, but this is a constant that comes from known quantities. It's not an adjustable parameter. <clears throat> so the force equals uh, this. 0.00014 times the current times the area of the plates divided by the separation between them squared. And this is what's predicted by quantized inertia. And it agrees almost exactly with what they uh, saw. So this plot shows the separation of the plates along the x-axis and the force of the y-axis. And uh, the observations are shown by the black diamonds and the squares show the prediction. And you can see it's pretty good. The, the prediction is within the error bars of the data. So I've actually put this already on the search gate. I'm going to submit it to a journal soon. OK, um, so another thing about Becker and Bat's study was very interesting in that they had their capacitor, which is here. Uh, so the, the electrons have been accelerated to the white. They see a, a ringular horizon here. and Becker and Bath actually did something that was very cheeky. They uh, put a metal plate both in front of the horizon and then they shifted it behind the horizon and they found that when they put it behind it, its effect on the electrons disappeared, which is very interesting because this is, um, uh, this is one of the bases of quantized inertia, that there's a horizon here that is blocking information from behind it. And it seems that maybe in, in, that is indeed true. So this could be the first direct observation of a Rindler horizon. Okay, so the, the upshot of all this is that uh, perhaps if we can confirm this, we, we can launch things with it. Um, so you can imagine a capacitor in a horizon drive, mass one kilograms, you have a battery and you could use a lithium air battery, which has a mass of one kilograms and would give 1.8 kilowatts. This is a cutting edge type of battery. And then you might have a payload of eight kilograms, for example. So the total weight would be nine, uh, 10 kilograms or 98 newtons, of course. Um, and then if the battery, if we have a horizon drive, which is producing 100 newtons per kilowatt, as the Becker and Bat experiment claims, then we would have 1.8 kilowatts. And so the force upwards would be 180 newtons. In other words, more than its weight. So this would enable levitation and launch um, without fuel, just using electricity. Okay, so applications. So within 10 years, this would be, this would tend to revolutionize the satellite industry. So if the Spanish experiment is confirmed, then we're already better than ion drives. Um, so they could have um, lighter satellites to launch. They don't need fuel and satellite station keeping. And later we could have, um, we could actually develop launch systems with this, um, with this sort of thing. It, it also makes interstellar travel possible for the first time because that's what propellantless thrust does. The problem with getting to say uh, Proxima Centauri um, in a human lifetime is that you need, to you need to go very fast and you carry an awful lot of fuel to make it possible. Um, a fuel equivalent to a, a minor planet. So this would provide thrust without the necessity for heavy fuel. Okay, so to summarize, quantized inertia explains inertial mass. It gets rid of dark matter. It has very good astronomical evidence behind it. It predicts a horizon drive, and we're doing experiments on this. And it has, obviously, a lot of applications. 
Oh, and yes, I'd, I'd also, um, at this point, I'd just like to thank Anpa for listening over the past few years. Um, every time I, I'm due to give a talk for Anpa, I kind of panic, and I, I, I try to work on the philosophical overview of the whole thing. Um, it's always an incentive to resolve issues like that, so, so thanks for that. Um, and thank you for listening. Any questions? Okay, uh, per perhaps Mike, you can you can stop sharing screen so we can see more participants. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I can see Peter has question. Peter, fire away, and then Anton. Yeah, I mean, if if you can uh, get the same results as general relativity in key cases, do we need general relativity? Oh, well, I, I would say no. <laughs> Because quantized inertia is a lot simpler. It's a lot simpler than... Yeah, we don't need all this horrible apparatus of curvature and all that nonsense. Yes, that's, that's right. Um, right. Okay, uh, that's, that's music to me, that. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, if you finished, Anton, you are next. We don't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Anton, unmute. Uh, okay, I've got myself unmuted. Good. Anton. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. Here. Most, most yeah, interesting. Thank you. Uh, it's um, your, yeah. My question on the, uh, on the capacitors, is that force only while charging or while the capacitor is charged? Because you had ah. a force formula which had a, a current term in it. Ah, this is capacitors during field emission. So there is a small current passing, about less, somewhere less than 10 microamps. Um, but it, they're not discharging, they're undergoing field emission. New term for me. Can you explain field emission? Of, well, the electrons are, are passing over in a, a quite a, a laminar way across the capacitor. It's not a, a sudden discharge or a spark. Uh, so uh, basically, there is a, a discharge with electrons migrating through the dielectric. Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, John, John Williamson, you have to unmute yourself. When, when you get to the limitations of inertia in galaxies, what sort of accelerations are we talking about when we get to the, uh, when we hit, hit the uh, 14 uh, billion light year boundary? How, how low does that acceleration have to be? Ah, uh, yes, it has to be uh, about eight times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second per second. That, that's where the, the effect begins to become apparent. And about two times 10 to the minus 10, it becomes, uh -huh dominant okay very interesting very interesting indeed um now um a supplement to anton's question as well we talk, you, you're talking about if you take two parallel plates those things are excluding states and the casimir states between the thing is the is the force that people are getting i, I should read the papers actually. i shouldn't ask you should uh, i've got to look these papers up but is it proportional to that uh, field that you uh, generate between the two plates or is it proportional to the current that's uh, that, that's flowing in the uh, in the field emission? It's the, the current. Um, it's just current. Okay, very interesting indeed. Anyway, good for you. This is great fun. <laughs> what a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, okay, before I get Nicola um, uh, to ask her question, I have to say that I was jumping up and down thinking, you know, finally all the books, I, I wasted my youth on reading all the science fiction, looks like coming true. <laughs> uh, well, so, we'll see. The proof is uh, in the proof, the pudding is in the eating, isn't it? So we need to levitate something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nicola, but please unmute yourself. Hi, Mike. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, well done. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to see the way things have gone with your papers. So I've got, so I've got two, I mean, comments really. Um, one is that I, I very much enjoy 
seemingly accidental symbolism. And QI is, of course, uh, one of the spellings of chi or life energy. So that's, <laughs> that's rather interesting. And, um, and uh, in terms of the possible implications, I, I think it sounds absolutely horrific um, because basically humanity has, you know, already we've got, you know, Jeff Bezos, we've got all these satellites, we've got, you know, all, you know, all these billionaires who are doing, you know, don't care at all about the fact that we've made a mess here and are just looking to go, you know, further off. And I'm thinking, yeah, 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 it's going to be even easier for them. Oh, no, <laughs> basically. Okay, well, I understand your point of view, but I'm kind of the opposite. I, I want us to get out there and uh, explore. And I, I don't think it's, it's really possible to perfectly tidy up a room before you leave it. Um, and I could also say that I don't think we'll really learn to look after our environment until we, we get out into space and we have to make our own environments. And only then probably will we understand how valuable they are. So. I think getting into space would be a good thing for the environmental movement, actually. Uh, and, and who will be getting into space? I mean, because what we've seen generally, I mean, so at the moment you're doing, you've got research for DARPA, generally um, you've got either uh, these sort of mad billionaires and you've got um, voracious nation states who, you know, want to stick a flag, you know, in, in the Arctic or Antarctica and then fight everybody else and say, this belongs to me. You know, airspace, that's mine. Um, so it's, uh, it's not exactly an idea of any, it's not a sort of um, an ethical, and you know, experiment where humankind is saying, oh, anyway, yes. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think this would be the solution to it because with technology, if this can be confirmed, the technology is relatively simple, so it democratizes the whole thing. So even small groups will be able to go into space. There's, there's, there's already a lot of space junk, isn't there? And, yeah. and we've, we've already, I mean, we've seen what, like, humankind from, from the year dot has sort of thought anywhere that looks like it's space, we can throw junk, right? So it used to be when we had like villages and stuff, it was just outside the borders. Right now we've got this huge plastic, uh, you know, bigger than a country um, floating in the ocean and killing lots and lots and lots of creatures and stuff. So um, I think this, you know, I, I, I find it difficult to be optimistic about what, uh, uh, yeah, humankind just say, oh, look, we've got big space. Let's, here we go. Let's. Let's see how we muck that up, <laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I understand, but I, I can't curb my enthusiasm. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, it's very interesting. And you know, like, like I said, I really like, I was wondering actually, just in terms of your diagrams, um, obviously it's kind of related to the work that you were doing before with, you know, the, with the ships next in, in harbours, et cetera, et cetera. But I was suddenly wondering about the, you know, the, um, what, now what's it called, the, the Z effect in water? You know, is it sort of the, the um, somebody, there's somebody else who, you know, Vanessa, you all know, surely, um, about it. It's not May Wan Ho. What's I've not heard of that one. Uh, yeah, the, some, uh, Mike Horner, you know who I'm talking about, the guy who did the, does those water experiments. Um, just You're talking bit. about exclusion water? The, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, Anton. Thank um, you. Yeah. The, uh, the exclusion effect, what is it? Uh, Pollock. That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just wonder, it just, it's sort of, I mean, it's just, just a vague similarity. And I just wonder, I mean, whether, whether there is any, um, you know, like a, like, a, like a mathematical similarity. Which yes, that, that's interesting. I did see a TED talk about something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Water differs right, very close to a conductor, something like that. Okay. Right. Uh, can I can I get John again into discussion? Yeah. yeah? Mike, I, I, I'm with you on this. I think this is fantastically exciting. Um, and uh, but it seems like what you really need now is a decent power source. Batteries aren't going to hack going to uh, Alpha Centauri. So um, 
Does, does anyone know what's happening at the moment with the sapphire energy source? Because that looked uh, very, uh, very encouraging. A, a light system producing large amounts of energy. Do you know the thing I'm talking about? Yes, yes, I have heard of that. Yes. Um, I, I was thinking um, RTGs might be might be enough. Uh -huh. But yes, uh, the sapphire, I'm, I'm quite interested in that experiment. I, I don't know much about it. But, um, I'm a little bit in touch with some of those guys. And uh, no, I'm very interested in new energy sources as well and producing really seriously large energy sources. And I have an idea for some of one of those as well which I might want to try to engineer in the not too far distant future. So if we can put that kind of stuff together, then we really can fly. Yes, that would be excellent. The other, the other thing is, um, the, another related question. We're talking about inertial, inertial, um, inertial shielding here. The other thing that you need to do, if you're really gonna get somewhere in a lifetime to somewhere like any, any star, basically, is it takes roughly 60 years to get to any star if you have a human on board and that we can only take about 4G. So if you accelerate at 4G going up and 4G coming down, you get to near the speed of light after about 30 years, and then you can go where you like. So, but if you could do inertial damping, which of course has been invented by Star Trek a long time ago, and then of course you can accelerate much more quickly than that. Any corollary where that is possible in your yes, thinking at that, the moment? That, that is definitely possible because I showed all those plots with the, the spectrum on it. Yes. You you can arrange that so as to cancel out the the inertial mass you normally would would have had. Well that's it then. That's uh, that's light speed yeah. travel, isn't it? Putting all those together. Right. Can I can I get James to come in as well? James, you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I have a couple of related questions. Um, um, Casimir effect, of course, depends on our boundary conditions. It's, electro, it's purely electromagnetic. So for instance, um, parallel plates attract spherical repel, of course. Uh, lift shifts show the, um, you know, right after Casimir that it, you don't even have to think of it as vacuum modes. It's a uh, zero point in, uh, quantum fluctuation modes of polarizable uh, material, which means it's purely electromagnetic. So my first question is, have you looked at- about that, isn't it? Um, have you looked at my, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, go on, go on. Yeah, yeah. My first question is, have you looked at it, not just planar, but, but um, spherical geometry, where it would be repulsive rather than um, um, attractive? And the second question is, particles like the Z boson and the W, the, the, the Higgs, the Higgs, the Higgs particle are not electromagnetically polarizable, so they wouldn't be affected by Casimir effect at all. And does that mean that they don't have inertia? Uh, so for the first one, it's, um, I haven't looked at a spherical geometry, but I've just been asked by DARPA to do that because they have another team uh, looking at the Casimir effect in different geometries, and they want me to predict how it's different for different geometries so it can be tested. Um, and then your question about WZ bosons and the Higgs, the Bonnaroo radiation is actually a, a wave in all the fields. It's not simply, not just the electromagnetic one, although I, in the way I'm trying to affect it, I'm using metal plates, which affects the electromagnetic, electromagnetic component. It's actually a wave in all the fields. So, these other particles should feel it. What I'm saying is the boundary conditions are unique to electromagnetism. So that's, that's how you get the Casimir effect. It is, you know, it's yeah. electromagnetic boundary conditions. Um, if, if it's not electromagnetic force, it would be a totally different type of boundary conditions. So, so I'm, I'm, that's just my point. Um, if, if, if it's not, if, if the particles don't couple to electromagnetic or at least have electromagnetic polarizability. Uh, whatever boundary conditions you're using, um, you know, or what determine the, the type of force. And then that would mean that um, the boundary, the, the amount of inertia would be different for different types of particles. The, the way you would do your calculation, if, if I understand it, the, the way I understood yeah, your calculation. Okay. 
Okay, can I can I suggest that John Williamson has the last word on this subject and we move on to Nicola's presentation. So John, please. Um, I, think, I think James, you're exactly on the on the right lines with what you're saying there. And I think um, I, I think that Mike's looking at some of these aspects already. I'm probably I, I'm presuming you're thinking about this. I had the honor of working with Casimir on on Casimir effects in different geometries. Uh, many years ago, he was still very active well into his 80s. And we looked at um, the effects of boundary effects on parallel plate systems and on spherical systems, and they were very different. Um, and uh, well, Casimir did the calculations uh, for us, and he found that the spherical um, forces, the spherical systems had a zero force for what we were looking for. Um, parallel plates. Um, had, 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 the, had the force which one calculates usually. And um, well, collectively we couldn't do toroidal systems at the time. So um, I think that I think that the way you're thinking, the comment you're making there is, 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 is a very important one in terms, of, in terms of what you're doing. So the shapes in these, in these electrodes which make a difference to how this works. And, and anyway, just to say that I think you're on the right lines there from some work that I did in the past.